Hello. Okay, good. There, it has worked. There's a delay, so uh, on my monitor, there's a delay. I didn't know if I was live yet. Hi, everybody. Uh, welcome to an adventure. I hope that you are having a great day. Um, so far, my day is pretty typical. Um, I delayed turning this camera on in the hopes that uh, it will function through the entire stream, but that means I need to log into it. Uh, because I just remembered that I delayed turning it on. So uh, my, my well-laid plans to avoid having to do this while live um, slightly defeated by myself. Uh, but it's fine. Uh, I'm just vamping for a second here. Okay, we are good to go there. Hi, Hannah. Uh, it is good to see you. I hope everybody is having a good Wednesday. Um, we are going to be having some fun with archives stuff today. Um, and let me go ahead and start as we normally do by just popping this up here. Um, I am Anthony Wright Day Hernandez, Community Collections Archivist for Virginia Tech. And this is the show that I do once a week on Wednesday, where I bring you things from the archives and special collections uh, here at Virginia Tech. Um, and since we're talking history and we are located at an institution uh, that has some history to it, as all of them do, especially in this country, um, these are official statements from the university regarding some of that history. So we like to take a look at them at the beginning of the stream. Virginia Tech acknowledges that we live and work on the Tudelo and Monacan people's homeland and we recognize their continued relationships with their lands and waterways. We further acknowledge that the Morrill Land Grant College Act of 1862 enabled the Commonwealth of Virginia to finance and found Virginia Tech through the forced removal of Native nations from their lands in Western territories. We understand that honoring Native peoples without explicit material commitments falls short of our institutional responsibilities. Through sustained, transparent, and meaningful engagement with the Tudelo and Monacan peoples and other Native nations, we commit to changing the trajectory of Virginia Tech's history by increasing Indigenous student, staff, and faculty recruitment and retention, diversifying course offerings, and meeting the growing needs of all Virginia tribes and supporting their sovereignty. Virginia Tech acknowledges that its Blacksburg campus sits partly on land that was previously the site of the Smithfield and Solitude Plantations, owned by members of the Preston family. Between the 1770s and the 1860s, the Prestons and other local white families that owned parcels of what became Virginia Tech also owned hundreds of enslaved people. We acknowledge that enslaved black people generated wealth that financed the predecessor institution to Virginia Tech, the Preston and Olin Institute and they also worked on construction of its building. Not until 1953, however, was the first black student permitted to enroll. Through inclusive VT, the institutional and individual commitment to Eprosin, that I may serve. In the spirit of community, diversity, and excellence, we commit to advancing a more diverse, equitable, and inclusive community. <clears throat> Thank you, uh, Hannah, for dropping the links for that into the chat. Um, is the music a little bit loud? I bumped it down after starting. It may have just been that song. Um, I can, I can bump it down a little bit more. Uh, we'll see how that goes. Let me know if it continues to be an issue. Hi, Shadows. Uh, it's good to see you. Um, so let's talk about what we're going to look at today. Yeah, the, that last track, OK. And, and see, instead of using a playlist that I have prepared, I'm using um, one of the curated lists now, um, just called Epic, uh, because it seemed like an appropriate theme for what we're going to be looking at today. Um, but if this playlist ends up being too loud, 
I can switch to something else. Uh, epic songs tend to get a little bit louder. So, um, all right, let me make sure that we're set for the screen share before I switch to it. Uh, we should be good. Yes, uh, thank you for, again, thank you for dropping the uh, Mubot command in. Um, yep, this week we are looking at a pulp sci-fi magazine that issued five issues. The first in 1940 and the other four in 1941. Initially, the first two issues, it was being published on a monthly schedule. And then after that, it switched to bi-monthly. And so, I don't know, I feel like before we go and look at the encyclopedia entry, which we will look at together because I think it's useful, especially when we want to know more about one of these speculative fiction items, I think it'll be useful to look at the items first. So I'm going to go out of order today and put us over to the um, top-down document camera first so that we can get a look at the magazine. And then um, I will share the encyclopedia. Um, one every two months, Shadows. Um, actually, okay, real quick, I will just show you so you know what it looks like and are not scared to go there, which I don't know why anybody would be, but um, if you follow the links that are in the, uh, the message from Mubot, it'll bring you here. <clears throat> the Encyclopedia of Science Fiction. This is a free resource um, that we actually have listed in our databases uh, for the library, and it has a lot of good information um, about things in the history of science fiction. Um, so this will take you straight to the entry for Comet, which is the name of the publication we're going to look at. You can see um, published by HK Publications, edited by F. Orland from Maine. Um, so I will cover most of this article, probably reading a lot of it to you um, once I get the actual magazine up on screen. Um, the other site that I have prepared to share, this is another um, resource for researching the history of science fiction. It is the Internet Science Fiction Database. Um, so this is similar to IMDB, which you are likely familiar with if you've ever tried to look up who that actor was in that show. Uh, this is for science fiction, the equivalent of um, the Internet Movie Database. Uh, incidentally, there is also IBDB, which is the Internet Broadway Database. Um, I'm not sure how many of these exist. Those three I'm familiar with, and they all tend to have decent information. Um, what this one has on Comet is limited. Or whose voice is that? Yeah, for, especially for like video games. Um, uh, but I did want to point to it. I may reference it at some point during the episode today. We'll see. Um, <clears throat> I do not have the German version, apparently. It indicates that there was a German version. And I'm not going to go to my talk page. I, I, I am registered to edit this, um, so it looks like I have a message. Uh, possibly because I submitted information about an issue of something that we had that was not listed. So, um, all right, let's do the document focus. I can show you the entire run of this publication that we have in two little boxes here. I'm going to zoom out because, wow, uh, we're in a little bit close to be showing these at least the way that they are. Uh, we'll just get the entire look for you here. 
<clears throat> this is five volumes of Comet. And, um, I mean, this is not the best way to see them, but just wanted to, like, the entire run of this magazine does not take up very much space. Um, as opposed to, like, if I brought up um, the magazine of fantasy and science fiction, uh, which technically the magazine of fantasy and science fiction starts with issue two, um, because the issue number one was just the magazine of fantasy, um, and they changed the name for issue two to the magazine of fantasy and science fiction. But um, that, I don't think I could get in the same shot. There are so many issues. Um, all right, so issue number one here is December of 1940. Definite style. I don't know who did the, the lettering. That'd be interesting if, to see if we can find out. Um, it feels very uh, Superman to me. Um, and so I'd be interested to know who did the title lettering um, and whether they had any association with DC Comics. Um, but so these are the first three issues, December of 1940, January of 1941, and March of 1941. Um, and then I also have the final two. Um, in this other box here, I'm just gonna just gonna pull them all out, and then I will talk to you about some info about this thing. Um, possibly shadows, possibly. It should. It, that doesn't mean it will. Uh, a lot of times, the artists, especially like it, it depends on the magazine and it depends on when it was published. Um, it is quite often the case that the artists on pulp, especially early pulp, weren't credited at all. Um, this is late enough that they should be. Uh, but here you can see the final two issues um, from May of 1941 and July of 1941. <clears throat> so, why did I pick this as a thing to talk about today? Any guesses? Because it would sure help me if you told me why I picked it, because I'm not certain. Actually, I have a I have a fairly good idea, but reasons, yeah. Um, excellent, that is a correct answer. Um, <clears throat> there were a couple of reasons. One, I enjoy working with this collection, um, our, our speculative fiction stuff. I like working with it. Um, so whenever I get the chance, I want to use the materials. I want to explore it. It's a personal interest of mine. I happen to know that the people who watch the show enjoy science-y type stuff, and um, that speculative fiction also generally acceptable as content. Um, so there's that. Uh, this particular magazine, um, it intrigued me because it was only five issues, and so I wanted to know the history. Uh, the title caught my eye. Um, yeah, things like that. I also, I brought another one that I was like, well, what if I'm done with Comet? And I need to have something else to look at. So I, I did bring Ghost Super Detective with me, um, but 
I don't think we're gonna get to this today. I will save it for another time because I think there's plenty to talk about with Comet just by itself. Um, it, I think it has an interesting history. So let's talk about that interesting history. Um, if you want to look at the encyclopedia entry, you can. Otherwise, you can just you know follow along and listen, and and I will talk about it. What I I mean, what I have learned is mostly this encyclopedia entry. Um, a U.S. pulp magazine, five issues. Uh, and if you have questions about like terminology, I know that I've covered pulp a couple of times on stream, but I don't know that we've ever really delved into why it's called pulp. I think we have because um, we have had issues that were in similar shape to this and crumbling in my hands. Um, but if anybody doesn't remember or you want to talk about it, we can certainly do that. Um, uh, five issues, December 1940 to July 1941, bi-monthly after January 1941. Published by HK Publications, edited by F. Orlin Tremaine. Um, Tremaine was the former editor of Astounding Science Fiction um, and made a brief and undistingu undistinguished return, according to this entry here, uh, to science fiction magazine editing with this title. Tremaine wanted to recapture the wonder of Astounding from the mid 30s but without the financial support of Street and Smith or the editorial support of Desmond Hall, the end result fell short. Amongst the more interesting items were contributions by Yondo Binder, Lee Brackett, Frank Belknap Long, uh, P. Schuyler Miller, Ross Rocklin, Clifford D. Simak, Harl Vincent, and Jack Williamson. Comet also published the first professional appearance by Sam Moskowitz, The Way Back, in Jan the January 1941 issue. The last issue was perhaps the best and contained The Vortex Blaster, uh, the first story of E.E. E. Smith's series of that name. A continuing feature was The Spacian, an imaginary future newspaper which betrayed the magazine's juvenile slant. Comet had little visual appeal. Its cover layout was particularly ungainly. So, it's an encyclopedia, it's an internet encyclopedia entry. It's very factual up front. It's very kind of biased as you get further in. It's not presenting things in, um, a dispassionate, factual way, uh, like an analytical way, it's, it's making judgments, like ungainly. It might be ungainly, but they don't explain why, which makes it come across as a personal opinion rather than an analysis. Um, however, the encyclopedia still functions as far as giving um, useful information that you can use on your own to interpret. Um, so this doesn't give a whole lot of information about why it stopped publishing, um, which I definitely came across. The question is, do I remember where I found it? And the answer is no. Um, so I, I might have to poke around uh, a little bit to see if I can discover where that was. But um, essentially, they launched this magazine. They were going to publish monthly. They published two issues, switched it to every other month, published three more issues, and then stopped publication because the people giving them the money to publish it stopped funding it. And they could no longer afford to publish the magazine. Um, I'm looking to see, okay. <clears throat> so, F. Orland Tremaine 
um, was an editor and author. Uh, he worked on Astounding Science Fiction, which is one of the big names of like 1930s era pulp science fiction. Um, he produced 50 issues of Astounding. Um, I'm, I'm reading the entry on him right now. Um, as an attention attracting device, let's see, it. no, no. Ah, Wonder, there was a reference to Wonder Stories, but it wasn't necessarily super useful. Um, So, in 1938, it looks like, he left Astounding. To found his own publishing firm, Orlin Tremaine Company, um, producing and editing Comet, uh, that didn't actually start publishing until 40, and then lasted through 41. Um, he wrote a number of stories under his own name, and at least one is uh, Warner Van Lorne. That's something that you'll find um, if you investigate pulp sci-fi or just the history of science fiction. Um, people who worked on these magazines often published under multiple names. Um, and as you look and you see that a magazine was like struggling to get writers, or yeah, things, like there would be reasons like that. Like, oh, they don't have enough authors, but they need it to look like they have more authors than they do. Publish under multiple names. Uh, and then the audience thinks that there are more authors than there are, um, but once you get to today, you know that, okay, all of these stories were by the same person, and uh, so they've got different monikers that you can find them under. Um, anyway. <clears throat> I took a glance through and did a bunch of reading uh, about the magazine before today so that I could have a list of items for us to glance at that seemed interesting. Another thing about this magazine, another thing that they did in their issues was they had a section of short shorts. So we're gonna read some short shorts for sure. Uh, short shorts in this context are not 1970s or 2020s um, short inseam clothing items. They are stories shorter than standard short story length. So, I have a couple of things that I thought would be interesting for us to look at. Um, if you happen to uh, pop in on the um, Internet Science Fiction Database and uh, look at the issues in there, they have a listing of the titles of stories, the names of authors, um, etc. So if you happen to see something there and you're like, Ooh, ooh, I've heard of this story, but I've never read it. And you want me to read it? Let me know. Uh, if, yeah, so if, if you find something that you particularly want to see, do tell. Otherwise, <clears throat> I have a path to chart. Um, all right, so comment. I don't know what S. F stands for here. I'm, I, I'm not certain, and I have not specifically researched that. If anybody is familiar, do let me know. Um, stories of, of super time and space. 
And so let's see, this is the first issue. I love the graphic. I love the like missile shaped bird. I don't think it's a ship. I think it may actually be a bird, but I'm not certain. Um, a startling tale of Saturn's radium madness. Momus Moon by Yondo Bender. I, what, what is STF? Okay, I think I need to know. The missing E slightly bugs? What missing E? Oh, at the end of, so that's a thing. Um, it's pulp. Inconsistency, cheap paper. These are characteristics of pulp. The, the later issues, like this has been chopped. This has been like sliced even. Like, so this is where the pages ended. So they cut the title. This magazine was designed for the cover to slightly extend past the end of the pages. So like this issue has not been cut right at the page edge and you've still got the E. This issue has been cut right at the page edges, um, which cut off the fringe of the uh, cover. So it was spaced properly. It's just that at some point, and I don't know whether this was at the point of publication or later, someone trimmed off those edges. Um, sorry. Messages from Twitch. Launching new features. Um, what was I looking for? Oh, STF. What is STF? I'm going to check the encyclopedia and see. Nothing comes up there. Um, oh, boy. Hello, Internet. Um, hmm. There's, let's see. Well, commercially sponsored club for STF readers. But what is STF? Usually pronounced Steph when said aloud, which is hard which it hardly ever is. STF is now rare, a rarely used abbreviation for scientific fiction. Sci-fi is easier to say than scientific fiction. I have heard the word scientific fiction before, but I had forgotten it. Um, so I'm glad I was able to find it. Uh, it was an earlier term for science fiction, scientific fiction. which applies to anything science fictional or part of the microcosm. So yeah, scientific fiction. This is the problem, like this would be a term that I would absolutely remember if I worked with this kind of stuff all the time. I don't. In fact, the only time I ever get to work with these materials is when I pull them for stream, um, which is why I didn't remember the term scientific fiction. Uh, and there was your customer interruption for the stream. Oh dear. Hey, I'm glad you get customers whenever I go live. I don't know if it's that I go live at a good time for customers to come to your shop, or somehow the fact that you want to 
attend the stream means that you get a customer because the entropy of my luck, that's the way it functions. But I'm glad you get customers. <laughs> um, cool. So, scientifiction, that's what STF stands for. Uh, thank you for bearing with me while I looked that up. Uh, so they have stories by R.R. R. Winterbotham, uh, P. Schuyler Miller, Raymond Z. Galun. It's interesting, they put the STF abbreviation after every single frickin' one. Uh, Clark Ashton Smith, D.L. James, Robert Moore Williams, Miles T. Brewer, None of these names are ones that I'm terribly familiar with. Um, P. Schuyler Miller is probably the one I'm most familiar with of all of the ones listed here. Uh, and then, don't miss the Spacian, a powerful new uh, science fiction feature that gives a new perspective on science fiction. Hey, they even had the term right on the cover. Um, <clears throat> edited by Orlin Tremaine. Um, so the thing that I had marked in this first issue for us to glance at, oh dear, where did, sorry, I want to be a bit gentle because they are in crumbly, um, crumbly status, so I don't want to like strain their spines, um, over much. I think this will do, I can zoom out some if we decide we need me to, but I think this will work. Um, <clears throat> I wanted to glance at page 101, although let's, let's first look and see if we can determine who did the cover design. Uh, indeed there are credits here, cover by Mori. Illustrations by Binder. So, Mori, M-O-R-E-Y. See if there's anything in the ISFDB. I'm hopeful. No, I want December of 1944, if I show Leo Mori uh, is the person. Leo Mori, legal name uh, Mori Ipeña Leopoldo Raul, birthplace Lima, Peru, uh, born October 24th, 1899. Um, death. January 1st, 1965. Maurice C. Do the art. It, I'm, I'm guessing, Shadows, you're probably correct. Maury is probably the artist for this, but not that, uh, which I had not quite gotten there. I was looking to see what I could learn about him. Um, lots of interior art. Yeah, um, so that's the cover art, but not the cover design. I would be really curious as to who did the cover design and lettering, but it doesn't seem like that information is provided. It just reminds me very much of like early like Superman. But this isn't a comic book. Comic books, they paid attention to things like who the letterers are. I don't know that they hired a letterer to do this, this title. 
it looks like the work of DC Comics letterers. At least to me. <clears throat> Um, yeah, that's a deep dive. I don't have the time to do that on stream. Um, I was like, oh, let's see if just a quick search. No. Uh, <clears throat> the quick search did not immediately give me um, a good resource with names and exemplars for a DC Comics letterers. Uh, so yeah, that's a deep dive. That's, that's a thing where like, I noticed it and would be interested to learn about it, but have not had the time to research it. And sadly it doesn't say, because I don't think Maury did the title. And I'd be curious who designed the title. Um, <clears throat> but page 101, it is very comic booky. And I, part of the reason it caught my eye and part of the reason was because the encyclopedia entry called it ungainly or unwieldy or whatever term they, they used. I don't remember which term they used. And I was like, it looks like a comic book. It doesn't seem bad to me at all. It just looks like comic book. Um, all right, I think I need more weight than that to hold this in place. Um, because this is the first issue, I wanted to look at this editorial, The Comet Is Here, by the person who decided that this magazine needed to exist. Uh, I thought that this was a good piece to look at in this first issue. Uh, none of the like most famous works from this came from this issue. So, <clears throat> The Comet is Here, editorial by Orlin Tremaine. Were you ever fortunate enough to watch a comet in its course across the sky? Did you ever sit up through the night hours and forget that they were passing in the glory of the sight of grandeur in the heavens. Some of us have had the experience and we can't forget it. The sweeping grandeur of the all-encompassing coma, the tale which dims and obliterates the stars and planets is comparable to nothing else in all the heavens. A cosmic spaceship which nears the Earth like a sightseeing interspatial bus from Jupiter seems to us to pause just for an instant at perihelion, then continues its course past the outer reaches of the solar universe and on, on into the uttermost magnitudes of space. It is thus the comet comes to you, pausing at perihelion for new passengers. Ooh, <clears throat> thank you, Hannah, for sharing that. I, that's probably one of the sources I looked at and just forgot for today. Um, our course is not set prosaically like the planet. We are free to roam the outer universe together on a trip through time and space. I want you to feel that it is our project, our rocket flight, into the realm of those super worlds that lie beyond the rim of sight. I want to hear your reactions every month so that we may set our course together through the star lanes. We can do it, you and I, as we have done it before, remember? It has to be a cooperative venture for the ship requires fuel for her journey. And you can help to provide that fuel, will you please? It doesn't require much effort on your part. We both want the finest science fiction gathered inside one single set of covers. I'm going to do my very best to fulfill that wish in the comet. 
This first issue will serve as proof when you consider the galaxy of stars that bordered, uh, that boarded our craft for its first trip. <clears throat> will you pass the word along? Tell your friends that I'm back aboard <clears throat> and urge them to try just one trip with us? Do it now while the first issue is still on the stands. Give them all the opportunity to start their files with the very first issue. If you'll do that for me, <clears throat> I'll gather the finest writers in the field together for you and the best artists, and between us we'll make our comet so worthwhile that it will reach out to new fields and a new audience. Nothing in this world or any other can be accomplished without united effort. We need a bigger audience every month to support the program of The Comet. I feel confident we'll get it with your help. We have seen the field scattered. Let's draw it together again, you and I. For me, it's like coming back again into the home circle. There isn't any other place where the feeling of kinship exists as it does in science fiction. We have dreamed dreams together and watched them come true. We have seen the New York World's Fair demonstrate the world of tomorrow as an actuality. We have seen the war in Europe demonstrate the machines of war described in science fiction years ago. We have seen the atom smashed as science fiction foretold that it would be. And now we are set to go again in our cosmic spaceship. The comet will travel, travel on its itinerary past the Milky Way, past the blind spot, into the unknown, Let's each of us invite his friends aboard. The ship is big enough to carry everyone. I'm counting on you. Um, December of 1940? When was the atom first smashed? I guess I don't know. I mean, definitely was before atom bombs. Nineteen thirty-two, <clears throat> April fourteenth, nineteen thirty-two, Cockroft and Walton split the atom, according to. The American Physical Society. Oh dear. <clears throat> I am sorry to hear that your internet was having troubles. Um, I was looking earlier and, and I know that there are other, there have been some internet issues from some ISPs today, but I wasn't particularly looking in your neck of the woods. So I hope that it comes back soon. Um, honestly, reading this editorial was kind of sad because he's so hopeful. And we know that it only lasted five issues. But he's so hopeful that he'll, that readership will grow with every issue and that it'll just be the darndest thing and and it failed after five issues. <clears throat> okay, so the, the Wikipedia article. Let's see what, what little tidbits we have in here. Edited by F. Orland Tremaine, who had edited Astounding Stories, one of the leaders in the science fiction magazine field for several years in the mid-1930s. Tremaine paid one cent per word, which was higher than some of the competing magazines. But the publisher, HK Publications, based in Springfield, Massachusetts, was unable to sustain the magazine while it gained circulation, and it was canceled after less than a year when Tremaine resigned. Comet published fiction by several well-known and popular writers, including E.E. E. Smith and Robert Moore Williams. 
uh, the young Isaac Asimov visiting Tremaine in... Th this is unrelated, honestly, but because I remember seeing this and I'm like, why is this part of this article entry? But I'll read it. Uh, visiting Tremaine in um, Kummel's offices was alarmed when Tremaine asserted that anyone who gave stories to competing magazines um, for no pay should be blacklisted. Asimov promptly insisted that Donald uh, Walheim, to whom he had given a free story, should make him a token payment so he could say he had been paid. That anecdote is about Orlin Tremaine, not about Comet, and honestly does not belong in this article, but was interesting nonetheless. Um, <laughs> a little bit of history of science fiction as introduction to the history of the magazine. <clears throat> At the end of 1940, HK Publications, a small New York publishing operation owned by Harold Her Hersey, decided to launch a new science fiction magazine titled Comet. First issue was dated December 1940, edited by Tremaine, Tre yeah, Tremaine, who was well known to and respected by the growing readership of science fiction because of his successful stint as editor of Astounding Stories. Paid a cent per word for, for stories. <clears throat> the respectable pay rate no doubt helped Tremaine, uh, but it put the magazine under additional financial pressure. Two other magazines launched at about the same time, Cosmic Stories and Stirring Science Stories, edited by Donald Walheim, and both paid nothing at all to writers on the basis that if the magazines were successful, money might be available in the future. Boy, I feel like we've heard that before with regard to some of the new ventures like streaming um, uh, that happen <clears throat> today. This annoyed Tremaine, and then it gives the Asimov anecdote again. But at least here, it's in context that ties it more directly back to the magazine. Uh, let's see. List some of the highlights that we're going to hopefully look at. Mentions the short, short story corner. There was a competition. Well, let's see what there there looks like two competitions. <clears throat> Ooh, the short short story corner was targeted at new writers. Uh, though established author authors were also asked to submit very short stories for this feature. Another competition, this time aimed at fans rather than writers, offered a prize for, of twenty five dollars to the fan who had to overcome the most difficulties in order to attend the 1941 World Science Fiction Convention in Denver. The Futurians, a group of New York science fiction fans, many of whom would later go on to become well-known science fiction writers, often produced stories that were the result of collaborations between four, five, or even more of their members. One example, The Psychological Regulator, was originally written by Walheim, rejected by Tremaine, and rewritten first by uh, Robert A.W. Londas, then by John Michel, and then by Elsie Batter, with Tremaine rejecting it again after each rewrite. Finally, C.M. Kornbluth rewrote it, and Tremaine accepted the story, publishing it in the March 1941 issue. Pay your writer. Pay your intern. Um, <laughs> holds comment on paying writers. Um, interesting uh, note about unpaid writers in the middle of the um, television and movie writers guild strike. Um, pay your writers. <clears throat> Appropriately. And Wages that don't let you live where you work are insufficient. 
Uh, yeah, anyway, sorry. Um, let's see what we can find. There's three novelettes. Those are going to be really lengthy and not for us today. Uh, we got short stories. We got the Spacian. We should take a look at the Spacian. Rocket Mail. The department that belongs to Comet readers. I'm curious about that in the first issue of a magazine. Like the correspondence section, the, the place that is for like featuring letters from readers in the first issue of a magazine. Where did they get letters from? So, I don't see the short, short stories listed in the contents for this first issue. Lord of the Silent Death. Uh, well, let's look at the Space Ian, and, but first let's glance at the rocket mail. Unless somebody wants to uh, object to that course of action. Dear readers, honestly, I kind of want to zoom in further because I'm trying to read off the screen that's on the, <clears throat> on the wall behind the camera and I can barely see it. So if you all don't mind, I'm going to zoom in a little. Maybe? Ah, oh, that's so much better. Dear readers, Here's the department, ready and waiting for your letters. The landing field is ready to receive your private rocket with its message. We expect it to be alive with letters as soon as you have had time to read, consider, and react to the first issue of the comet. This is my first chance to write a letter to the department, so I'm taking full advantage of it. I'm not gonna rate the stories, that will be up to you, but please don't delay doing it. The weeks fly past and the second issue will be coming. I'm hoping to have enough quick letters so that I may stick them into the second issue before it goes to press. But this will be possible only if they are mailed in within the first few days of publication of this issue. I have received letters from many of our favorite authors. I might almost say all of them promising to write for the comet. Some of them say very nice things but I felt it would be sort of anticlimactic to publish them. Let's make this space expand and keep it alive. We can, but don't forget to tell your friends about the comet. F. Orland for me. <gasps> N.B. Uh, I don't know what N.B. means. Does anybody know what that abbreviation means in this context? It seems to be taking what, like if this was a handwritten letter, I would expect like PS, like postscript. I don't know what NB is. <clears throat> NB, I no sooner completed the above letter than one from Sam Moskovitz came to my desk with a fan's summation of the field today and saying things which obviously I could not say. It is a pleasure to know that some of us remember you can well believe. Here it is. Dear Mr. Tremaine, it is indeed a pleasant task to write you telling of my sincere delight at learning of your new post at the head of a new science fiction magazine. As usual, Fantasy News blared the news out to the fantasy world, but in an unusually large headline. Upon learning of your position, I hot-footed it to New York, accidentally bumped into Jimmy Tur uh, Tarasi, and visited your offices, but unfortunately came on a Tuesday, upon which day the receptionist informed me you did not come to the office. I hope you plan to do what I think you're going to do set a blistering pace for the other science, science fiction magazines to follow as you did in 1934, 35, and 36. It seems a shame that now, when the fans have what they have been praying for for years, a practically unlimited supply of science fiction, new and old, 
there should not be one, not even one, out of a score of fantasy magazines that is publishing new stories of even a breathable color. On every side, one sees hack, hack, hack. Editors so infatuated with names that stories do not count. One editor brazenly informed me at an interview that because he pays a low rate per word, he has told numerous scientific scientific fiction authors that when their yarns have been rejected by every other fantasy magazine, he would take them, sight unseen. But that's not all. There's more. Not content with getting the most worthless tripe some of these popular hacks are capable of turning out, stuff so terrible that fan mag fiction is beginning to read like polished material to me. <clears throat> oh, we can talk about fan mag fiction. He must print these stories under a pen name because the writers do not want the one cent markets to know that they are selling their stuff at half rates or less. Now by all that is holy under heaven, Why, why, if after purchasing a prominent author's most terrible fiction, uh, sorry, you are not even allowed to use his name? What is the earthly sense in purchasing it? Where is the advantage? Why not give the new writers a break and purchase good stuff? Like this makes, this is, Seems a valid complaint. Like, okay, you're spending money to buy the less good work of a popular author. But because they don't want the people who pay them a rate of one cent per word to know that they're selling a story at less than that, they won't let you use their name while publishing it. So you know it's good, you, you know, like you're buying it because he said earlier, you're buying it because it's from this person. You don't care what the content is. It was written by so-and-so. But then you don't even get to use their name when you publish it. Why are you buying it? <clears throat> um, so there's the situation. We have magazines featuring novels, magazines featuring novelettes, magazines featuring short stories or a variety of all lengths. There are magazines featuring straight science fiction, science fantasy, science adventure, fantasy, fantastic adventure, and weird. But there's no fantasy magazine printing new material featuring good science fiction. We are told <clears throat> that the great mass of unknown readers, whoever they may be, will not read good science fiction and they must appeal to the great unknown mass of readers who have never written in, yet whom they are so certain would not take kindly to good quality science fiction. During 1934, 35, 36, and even 1937, as editor of Astounding, you printed scores of stories that were out and out classics of science fiction. I'll never forget them as long as I live. It isn't necessary for me to refer to my old issues to remember their titles. Only a scant few of them are Farewell to Earth, Colossus, Rebirth, Shortwave Experiment, Mana from Mars, Succubus, Rex, Twilight, Man of the Ages, The Mole Pirate, Old Faithful, The Lotus Eaters, Night, The Mad Moon, Davy Jones Ambassador, The Red Perry, The Adaptive Ultimate, Alas, All Thinking, He from Procyon, The Far, the far Way, Stars, the plain people, etc., etc., etc. You ran anywhere from one to five stories an issue that might be called classics of science fiction. <clears throat> Still, you found time to discover science fiction authors who are among the most prominent of our time. Ross Rocklin, R.R. Winterbotham, Oliver E. Sari, L. Sprague de Camp, Thornton Eyre, Eric Frank Russell, Willie Lay, Nelson S. Bond, Robert Moore Williams, Harry Walton, John D. Clark, PhD, D.L. James, and quite a number of others, not to mention those many obscure authors who developed into big names over a period of a few years. And despite the fact that you printed first-class fiction and used new authors, I have always been under the impression that Astounding had a pretty nice circulation under your editorship during a time when science fiction was unpopular. 
I guess I am what I am driving at is fairly clear. So wishing you luck is quite superfluous, uh, su superfluous, unnecessary. I'm almost certain your new magazine will be successful. Well, you were sadly mistaken. To round things up, I wish you'd take this letter as an open invitation to attend the meetings of the Queen's Chapter of the Science Fiction League. Uh, we have gatherings averaging about 30 prominent authors, artists, editors, and science fiction fans every month. And I feel certain you would enjoy the meetings and gain valuable contacts from them also. Sincerely yours, Sam Moskowitz in Newark, New Jersey. <laughs> Wow. Uh, Nota bene. Thank you, Iron Trout. Uh, also, welcome in. Uh, Nota bene, which I have heard before, I just didn't remember it, is used interchangeably with PS, although Nota bene and B uh, notes important information rather than afterthought. Got it. Thank you. Also, shadows, thank you as well. <laughs> uh, are you certain of that, Iron Trout? <clears throat> I, I would not necessarily be surprised. Uh, this, this list of these are the good stories. Um, uh, I, I'm, I'm assuming it's a joke that you're saying that they're all written by like Asimov and Heinlein, it's Heinlein etc. Um, it's possible. Also, I'm, I'm tempted. I'm so tempted. We might have a spin-off episode from this episode at some point in the future. I'm going to take a photo of that list. And I'm going to attempt to find all of those stories in our speculative fiction collection. I don't know that we will have them all, but I'm going to try. And if we have enough of them, I'll do an episode where we look at them. Because we read this letter where it notes these as important good science fiction that this author of science fiction would call classics. So I want to see how many of them are actually in our collection. <laughs> You're more interested in succubus for reasons. A lot of those names you read off go on to be big sci-fi writers. Um, yeah, I mean, I, there were definitely some, some people who published in Comet um, who went on to be big names. Um, just because I don't know all of them doesn't mean they didn't go on to be big. Um, I think it's time we look at some of the, uh, the fiction. I'm curious about the, um, the short, short fiction, uh, which apparently wasn't in the first issue. <clears throat> I'm curious about, uh, well, I have some other items noted. Uh, let's look at issue number two. Um, so this one you can see, I love the, I love the cover art on this one. Oh, let me drop it here and I can zoom out a little bit. Uh, we can get a better look at the cover. I love this cover art. Uh, I used it for like the the title screen for today. Um, that is on Mars. And you can see the Martians here at the bottom. <gasps> moon Moon's really named Monus Moon? 
Oh, that's, that's Momus Moon, M-O-M-U-S. I don't know, that one's pretty long, so I haven't read it. It's by Yondo Binder, if you're interested in looking it up and, and taking a look at it yourself. Um, but it, it's a little too long for me to try and read it on, um, <laughs> the moon's real name is Momus Moon. Um, I just, I love this, this piece of art. I believe that this, uh, there was a description of it. So the cover was done by Frank Paul. And... Oh gosh, I don't, I don't remember. I don't know if it was just my interpretation of the picture. I thought I had read something about the cover. But regardless, it looks to me like this is some sort of cannon on Mars aimed at the moon. And there's a human up here on this support cable um, some sort of, I don't know what this thread is, uh, but I think he's trying to stop the cannon from shooting and destroying the moon. Um, that is my guess based on this cover. The Martians, I, I have to assume they're not happy with him trying to interfere with their, oh, you couldn't see the human. Sorry, he's up here. Um, and, and the moon is over here. I, I love this. I love this picture. I, do, I don't know why. I love these Martians. Look at these Martians. They're flying saucers. They have a little slit with their eyes in, but then they've got these like floppy like flipper hands. So neat. I love sci-fi. Um, all right, so in this issue, on tour with the Legion of Space in The Lightning's Course by John Victor Peterson. Uh, they also had stories by Harl Vincent, R.R. R. Winterbotham, uh, Frank B. Long, Yondo Binder, Frank Edward Arnold, H.L. Nichols, Sam Moskowitz, who the letter we just read was Sam Moskowitz. Uh, don't miss the short, short story department, It's Your Opportunity, edited by Orlin Tremaine. Um, of these authors, the one I am most familiar with name-wise is Harl Vincent. Uh, that doesn't mean I could tell you anything he wrote. I just recognized his name. So, <laughs> uh, let's see. Um, <clears throat> issue number two. And those are the people that made the cover, but... The, um, volume one, number two, January 1941, yeah, page 97. Page 97 in the short, short stories um, is one of the best known works from this uh, publication. A Green Cloud Came by Robert W. Londes, um, who is better known Rob as Robert A. W. Londes. Um, so short, short stories is definitely where we're going. And remember, short, short stories was where the readers could uh, submit for possible publication. But first, before we look there, I need to go to page 94 so we can see the start of the short, short stories section. <clears throat> Here is the opportunity department for newcomers. Every month we will publish short story, or er, every month we will publish short shorts, giving preference to first stories. If you have wanted to write science fiction, 
Now is the time to start. This department will discover the coming favorites. The editor, this was a great idea. Like, they're asking for short shorts. They don't want even standard short story length. They wanted shorter than that. Just a sample of what your writing is like and giving preference to the first stories by authors. Like, this is a great idea. Encourage new authors to try their hand and, and then publish their work. And if people respond to it, go back to them and get a full length short story for a future issue. I wonder, so since this magazine was paying uh, one penny per word, which was, as noted, significantly more than a lot of others, I wonder if these stories were paid. A Anson McDonald, Lyle Monroe, John Riverside, Caleb Saunders, and Simon York are all names Heinlein published short stories under. Yeah, uh, you might have gotten here after I talked about the fact that um, lots of authors published under many different names. Oh, you, um, Shadows, you write sci-fi? That's cool. Minimum is generally 500 words minimum at like five cents a word. Um, for what time period, Iron Trout? Because uh, all of the analysis of this publication was that it, uh, paying one cent per word was um, significantly more than most of the other publications at the time. For now, five cents a word is now, okay. But so you can see the short, short stories, the, the one we're not reading, The Last Man by Charnock Walsby, um, was about two and a quarter pages in length. Uh, but we're gonna look at A Green Cloud Came by Robert Londis, um, because this is supposed to be one of the more, uh, one of the best items published in this magazine in all of its five issues. So why don't we take a look? Um, <clears throat> it does have a lovely little illustration. Uh, I can try and zoom in on the illustration and see if we can get a better glimpse of it, but I don't know how good we'll be able to get. Because um, it is a very... Oh. There. Some figures in a cloud. Uh, and if you use your imagination, uh, you may be able to make the cloud green. I can't. I can register the fact that the cloud would be green, but I can't picture things in my head, so I can't make the cloud look green to myself. I don't know if people that can picture things in their head are able to do that. You did flash fic for a bit. Stories under a thousand words, okay. Oh, and remember in the letter, it mentioned fan fiction. There were entire publications of fan fiction. I think we have some of them. I'll have to pull some of them. Um, but that would be like similar to, like there's fan fiction today for lots of things. Um, and yeah, it existed historically as well. Um, so not, not an internet phenomenon. It existed before the internet. That's another thing. I should look for, um, I should do a show about fan fiction. Um, uh, 
because we definitely have some some fan fiction um, publications. So I can we can look at them. <clears throat> All right, A Green Cloud Came by Robert W. Longus. All I could see out the window was green whirls of it and people where they had fallen. I'm gonna take a sip of water and then dive in. <clears throat> Her fingers lightly caressed a button on the long table as she half turned toward him. At this moment, she was glad they still wore the semi-barbaric accoutrement donned for last night's festivities, commemorating the conclusion of the final war. Weird, fantastic trappings selected more for adornment than for appro uh, approximations of ancient military dress, for he would not notice that she was trembling. When at last she spoke, her voice was steady. Please go now, quickly. His hands made as if to clasp her arm, then dropped to his side. For an instant, he stood there, words welling to his lips. Then, with a half shrug, he turned away. She did not move as he strode toward the doorway, glanced out the window. Her back was a picture of composure. Natala! It was not a command, or yet a call, but a cry of astonishment, blended with horror. Well, I apparently said it wrong then. Natala! That, more like that. Uh, <clears throat> gone was her carefully built up poise as she whirled, then gasped as she saw the look in his eyes. Swiftly, she hurried toward the window, but he stood in front of her, blocking her view. What is it, Eric? Don't look, he gasped. For a moment, she felt fear coursing through her, fear that at this moment, he would wilt, give way to terror. She bit her lips, telling herself she couldn't endure the sight of it. But an instant later, the panic had left him. She could see rugged determination flowing back into his being, almost faint with thankfulness for the strength of him. She relaxed against his body, permitted him to lead her across the room to a sofa. Do you remember Greer? His voice was analytically thoughtful. He was the little astronomer who made those startlingly radical predictions about a year ago. Remember how we all checked his data? No one. Oh. No one could find anything of the sort, even though we checked and rechecked a dozen times. The conclusion was the conclusion was the only one that could be drawn under such circumstances. Greer was suffering from delusions, so he was cured by the psychiatry department. Her nose wrinkled in concentration. Greer? Was he the one who claimed to have discovered a sort of gaseous cloud in space? Our system was supposed to be approaching it. When it reached our atmosphere, it would prove a deadly poison to all life forms on this planet? Yes, that's it. Well, it seems he was right. It's come, the green cloud. All I could see out that window was the nauseous whirls of it and the people where they'd fallen in the streets. Neither of us can leave this building. He snapped on the telescreen. It lit up. He could hear the faint hum of the machinery, but no images appeared. Dead. Eric, it couldn't be. He paced up and down the floor, clasping, unclasping his hands. I don't know, I, it, sorry, I don't know. It came without warning on a night when nearly everyone was out celebrating. No one in the streets or parks could have been prepared for it. Most of the dwellings were probably left with windows opened. It's only sheer luck that it wasn't the case here. And luck again that we came back early. Please sit down, she begged. He looked at her a moment, then shrugged, came over to the sofa and sat beside her. There must have been some, Eric, she said. The law of averages would seem to indicate that. There might be some who are naturally immune to whatever brand of poison this is, some who escaped as we did, some who were underground or in forests. 
But until we learn differently, we must assume that we are the only humans alive. His eyes were haunted. How could we have missed it? He whispered. We checked and we checked all the data and put it to the calculating machines. The answer was the same each time. No cloud existed. Perhaps there were some factors that only Greer himself knew. Sometimes small items concerning his calculations which he overlooked in presenting data, not realizing that it had influenced him. If one factor were missing, known only to Greer, then all the machines in the world might might well give a, de a bleh, then all the machines in the world might well give a negative result. He shook his head. It's fantastic. Yet, what can we think? If your idea of a missing factor is correct, we'll never know. Even if Greer is still alive, he was cured of his delusion. She was silent for a moment. Then she slipped off her gloves, laid a hand on his arm. Aaron, she whispered, I'm sorry it had to happen at a time like this. It may be that Sandra escaped too. I know what she means to you. If we find her later, I shan't stand in the way. He chewed his lips. That's all over now. The first thing we must do is check up on the food, water, and sanitation system. Just how long the machines will run without human supervision is questionable. Not long at any rate. The robots cannot do everything alone either. Her eyes were calm and clear, her voice a breath of cool air in the heat of his anguish. Then let's do it the same way, Eric. Nothing is going to happen for a while. Let's tackle the problem after we are refreshed. She moved to free herself from him. He had, automatically, slipped his arm around her waist, drawn her to him. You, you can use the lab for your quarters. Good night, Eric. He held her back. Natala. Let me go, she murmured. Natala, wait. I didn't tell you all I saw. It was more than the cloud. He fell silent, breathing rapidly. Well, she said, I was reading some of the old books yesterday, some of them centuries old. The people then. Most of them didn't live as well as we do, but they were very much like us in some other ways. They, well, sometimes a man would think he had fallen out of harmony with his mate. In this book, the other man, or it, sorry, in this book, the man thought he'd found another woman more suitable to his psyche. He was about to obtain a release, divorce, I think they used to call it, when she was injured in an accident. His mate, I mean. The medical experts did not think she could live. He realized then, when it seemed to be too late, that there could never be any other mate for him. They didn't have psycho-adjusters in those days, so if she died, he would be affected for many years. The only way emotional upsets would, could wear off was through the primitive process of letting time wear them down little by little. It all ended well, however, because medical experts discovered that it was only her psyche that made the injury seem fatal. When she found that he still wanted her to be his mate, she recovered. Eric, what are you trying to tell me? That I don't want to be released from you ever. Even if this had never happened, if what I saw out there was only my imagination, I know now that I was only deceiving myself when I sought release from you. Sandra? Well, I rather like her, but she could never take your place. I wish to be your mate, Natala. Her eyes answered him, he thought. You're tired, Eric. But perhaps you'd better not spend the night in the lab after all. He reached down, picked her up in his arms. In the old days, he said, it was considered particularly fine form for a man to carry his mate to their sleeping quarters. She smiled and buried her face against his shoulder. No need to tell him that she, too, had read the old books, or that she'd rigged up a, rigged up a special or that she'd rigged up a Z-special screen outside that window, projected a carefully made film on it. After all, she hadn't seen the green cloud. He'd held her back. And hadn't he mentioned something about it being his imagination? She wouldn't be too harsh on him, of course. 
Tomorrow morning, when all was discovered to be well and she was positive that he hadn't noticed her fingers slide over the button as she leaned against the table a moment ago, the button summoning a robot, pre-instructed to dismantle the apparatus. 24th or no 24th century, men were still such dear fools. I think that was the end. Yep, that was the end. I mean, it, it's definitely a product of its time. It has a little bit of romance, a little bit of intrigue. Um, I, they're, in my experience, uh, speculative fiction from this era, um, women are either objectified or manipulative. And that's about the extent of their roles. Um, and this definitely fits into the manipulative uh, sort of vein there. I thought it was an interesting little story. Um, what did what did you all think of it? Did was that? So that one, it was um, uh, Robert A. W. Londes, who is a well-known author. Um, Londes. Uh, 1916 to 1998, American sci-fi author, editor, and fan. Best known as the editor of Future Science Fiction, Science Fiction, and Science Fiction Quarterly, among many other crime fiction, western, sports fiction, and other pulp and digest size magazines for Columbia Publications. Um, Londes was also a horror enthusiast. As a young fan, he received two letters of encouragement from that oh-so-problematic figure, uh, Lovecraft, uh, wrote a number of dark fantasy stories such as The Abyss, The Leapers, uh, let's see. Wow, lots of, um, lots of Lovecraftian-inspired stuff in his works, it looks like. So he, he mostly worked in horror, it seems. And I could see, I could see like the beginnings of that, like sci-fi horror in, in the story that we just read. Um, let's see, I don't have anything marked from issues three or four to glance at, um, because there were things in the fifth, the fifth issue was definitely the best issue, uh, but this is issue three, and whoever that woman is inside that rocket, or whoever that feminine-faced person is inside that rocket. In comparison to the person in the space suit, she seems very large. Unless that window has magnif magnifying properties. Um, <clears throat> interestingly, I only see, oh, it's, it was 20 cents in the US, 25 cents in Canada. The, the price, the U.S. price is in the upper right corner there. Um, two features. The Immortal by Ross Rockland will be called a classic. The Star of Dreams by Jack Williamson, a vivid, gripping novel about hellstones. Stories by Stanton A. Uh, Hoblins, Robert Moore Williams, uh, J. Harvey Haggard, John Victor Peterson, Arthur Cook, 
And then, of course, the short, short stories. Um, this one is in not as good condition. Still better than issue four. Our stories with the immortal. Uh, a story of time beyond time that will hold you long after you have laid it aside. You will not forget it. Um, it's quite long. We don't have time to read it right now. Uh, uh, let's see. The Star of Dreams, which is the Hellstones one. <clears throat> Novelettes, The Psychological Regulator by Arthur Cook, which is a quite famous story. Uh, but again, it's a bit too long for us to, to read right now. No wonder the publishing company couldn't afford to keep this one up if Tremaine was paying one cent per word, but the whole issue only sold for 20 cents. Yeah. <clears throat> Indeed. They needed a lot of readers to make up that, the difference. And so they didn't have the, the, the publishing company just apparently wasn't willing to fund it long enough for them to build the readership. Uh, Dark Reality, Headhunters of uh, New America, Healing Rays in Space, Lie on the Beam, it's Comet Tragedy, the, pl the Planet of Illusion. Ooh, we should look at the Spacia. Page 67. Uh, Headhunters of New America. The Spacian is a fake newspaper? Um, which could be, could be interesting if I can get the pages turned to the right page. Whew, okay, here goes. The Spacian. Published by the Interplanetary Patrol, editions on all spaceships. The wiki article about Tremaine seemed to indicate he had some problems running slash editing for companies. That There is that. Um, he resigned, which ultimately is what led to the downfall of this publication. Um, so, oh, really? Like, I didn't even launch the darn thing until right before we went live because I wanted to avoid losing control of the camera in the middle of stream. But once again, the camera has frozen. Uh, or at least my control of the camera has been lost. I also just accidentally unplugged my headphone. Okay, one second. I just have to like, off, on. And then uh, log back into this website so that I can control the zoom on the camera. Uh, because while a remote control is available, the remote control costs over $600 to, actually, I think we have the remote control. It's just, if we want to use the control, it was like another $600. It was very expensive and so we didn't spend the money, so can't use the remote control. We, we looked for a camera that had a remote control It was not immediately clear that um, there were conditions of lots of additional money in order for the control to actually function. All right. But it's connected to the internet and I can log into a, a, the IP address and control it from there, which has been working well. It's just that at some point in time, recently, it started that uh, like losing access to that page in the middle of stream. Um, and I don't know why. 
<clears throat> the Spacian, published by the, er by the Interplanetary Patrol Editions on all space ships. Uh, Planetogram service, February 2nd, oh, oh, or February 2009. Or is that February 2009? I'm uncertain. We can figure it out together in a second after I say hello to um, the Whimsies. Hello, welcome uh, everybody from 16-Bit Eric's stream. Um, it is good to see you. I hope that you had a good time uh, with the League of Whimsy today. Um, if anybody's here who was not already following 16-Bit Eric, you definitely should. Um, I will say uh, hello and welcome. Um, I will introduce myself real quick here. Um, hi. Uh, you're rating in on my channel, Rogan27. Um, this is a show that I do twice weekly, uh, or once weekly, wow, every Wednesday, every Wednesday I do this show. Um, I stream it to two channels at the same time. Uh, I am Anthony Wright Day Hernandez, Community Collections Archivist here at Virginia Tech, and I stream this show both to the uh, Virginia Tech University Library's Twitch channel, which is twitch.tv slash VTUL Studios, as well as to my personal channel, uh, twitch.tv slash Rogan27 which is where you all just joined us. Um, and this show is all about me sharing things from Special Collections and University Archives here at the University. Uh, today, we are looking at a five-issue pulp science fiction magazine uh, titled Comet. Um, and so far, it's been kind of interesting. I have all five issues. Um, so if you wanna poke around and learn about the magazine, and if you see anything that you want me to share, let me know. Um, because it's fun looking at old, old, old pulp sci-fi. We just read, um, a, a story by, uh, Robert A.W. Londes, uh, titled A Green Cloud Came, um, and it was a very 1941, it was, it was very on point for the time period, uh, where women in speculative fiction were objectified or manipulative, and in this case, manipulative. And it was it was a good little short, short, short story. Uh, so yeah, welcome in everybody. It's great to have you here. Uh, Adriosa, welcome, it's good to see you. Um, and uh, Be Right UK, thank you for the resubscription. Welcome back for 29 months. Uh, yeah. Okay, I'm gonna switch back, and we are just taking a look at one of the planned regular features, um, since this only published five issues, um, it, can it really be called a regular feature? I don't know. Um, the Spacian, which is a fake newspaper published in, um, in the magazine, uh, we're presently looking at issue number three of Comet, uh, which I'll zoom out here a little bit and you can see the cover of issue number three, March 1941, 20 cents, 25 cents in Canada. Uh, yeah. Ant society and dictators. Sorry, it's, it's on the left-hand page and I don't, I don't know what it is. <clears throat> We're looking at the Spacian. Published by the Interplanetary Patrol editions on all spaceships. Planetogram Service, February 2009, Volume 21, November, or sorry, uh, Volume 21, Number 3. Flash! Planetary coma is reported by two more ships. Although in widely separated areas, it appears to be a contagious, or it appears, wow. <clears throat> I've also been talking for almost two hours, so let me try that again. Although, in widely separated areas, it appears to be contagious, and all ships must remain in space until after medical inspection. The cause remains a mystery, although the foremost medical minds have been working toward solution. It is no longer fatal if caught in time. All ships are equipped with serum. Oh, Shadows, I will hydrate. Thank you for that. So these are, essentially these are short, short, short stories.
because they had this segment <clears throat> with the short shorts um, that we just looked at with a green cloud came. These are short, 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 short shorts. These are like a little like blurb, but it's a story. Flash fiction, it, indeed, yes. <clears throat> Flash, space liner XQ-20 came into port with a strange metallic coating. So far analysis has proved futile and there is no record as to when the coating adhered to the surface. The crew was as amazed at the sight as the spectators when the ship reached port since it did not adhere to the port site. Until we know what the metal is, it will be generally known as gold plating from the exact resemblance. Cutter MV927 is going to follow the same route and try and locate the cause. <clears throat> Flash. The heavy fleet is almost ready to leave Mars, and the trouble on the binaries will soon be under control. The call for volunteers resulted in many times the number of men who could be used and the commander wishes to thank all men who have offered their services, whether he has been able to use them or not. The crews are being trained strenuously and by the time the fleet reaches battle location, the men will be accustomed to their posts. You did flash uh, fiction for a blog you wrote? Now everything in that is very out, out of date. Uh, I mean, that happens a lot with blogs. <clears throat> Flash. Patrol cutter MV-18 sent out SOC within gravitational pull of Jupiter. All power tubes reported blown out and ship a helpless wreck from encounter with three pirate craft, slowly being drawn toward the planet and must receive help before pull becomes too great. Three ships reported on way to intercept, but as yet, there is no report of success. <clears throat> if anybody knows, uh, what does SOC stand for? I'm familiar with SOS, although I don't think I know what SOS, SOS stands for either, but SOC, it's serving the same function, but I'm not familiar with SOC. So I would be interested to learn if anybody knows. Flash. Only three men were alive on board MV-9 when the hospital and rescue ships reached her. These were an assistant engineer, the third officer, and one passenger. So far, names are not known. Flash. The crew of XQ-45 was found guilty of criminal negligence in the accident with MV-126, resulting in 26 fatalities. The outcome of the trial is not public as yet, but the officers will be sentenced. <clears throat> Orders. Admiral Alan H. Smith ordered to take one section of the heavy fleet from Mars to the binaries. Ordered to take effect immediately. Captain C.T. Trent from Mars Station 18 to Earth 3. Sounds like chess moves. Uh, Captain P.S. Brown from Jupiter Station 2 to Saturn Station 1. Both assistants took to accompany him. Lieutenant Martin Riggs relieved of command of Cutter MV-8 to take charge of Cutter MV-701, which finished testing. Wow, it keeps going. Let's see. Ooh, let's read the new inventions one. <clears throat> new Visiplate wave conductor has shown marvelous results. In the first tests, it has uh, carried clear images for 20 million miles. There is little doubt that within a short time, dealing can be... Ah! Wow, I didn't parse the sentence as I was reading it. I had to pause. Sorry. There is little doubt that within a short time, dealing can be carried on between two planets, with the goods in question seen by both parties. The wave enables dimensional broadcasts so that a person or object appears in natural form. The new electronic guns are being rushed to Mars for installation on the heavy fleet. They have only just passed the first tests, but will enable the fleet to put an immediate stop to the binary's war, without killing the millions of inhabitants. They destroy practically every type of material without injuring human beings. The binarians are apt to find their buildings nothing but ashes over their heads. 
Plexo metal is being manufactured commercially and will soon replace all other materials for its use in space. Uh, its lack of gravitational attraction makes, makes it ideal for rocket use and will cut down blast fuel consumption for clearance by almost two-thirds. It is amazing to see a sheet of solid metal almost float in the air, but it holds high hopes for the future. The actual weight is only nine ounces per cubic foot. Cool. I, the whole like fake newspaper thing is really interesting. I wonder who wrote all the blurbs, because it didn't, I, I wonder, it, yeah, there's no author like listed on the pages of the Spacian. There's no author listed in the table of contents for the Spacian. So I wonder, I wonder if they were written by Tremaine. He was an author as well as an editor. Or possibly they were written by people and submitted, uh, although they had a section specifically for um, readers to submit work, which was the short, 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 sorry, the short, short stories, not the short, short, short stories. Um, I don't have anything planned to feature from issue four. Issue four, May 1941, um, is this one. Locked in ice caverns on Neptune in Ice Planet by Carl Selwyn. Uh, Derelicts of Ur Uranus by J. Harvey Haggard. The Facts of Life by P. Schuyler Miller. Skytrap by Frank Belmont Long. We Are One by Yondo Binder. Uh, and When Time Rolled Back by Ed Earl Rep. Um, and yeah, there's a lot. The, the STF, we had to look up STF for anybody that wasn't here earlier. STF stands for um, Scientifiction, which was a term for science fiction, uh, uh, the earlier term for science fiction, scientific fiction. Um, a new printed alphabet on page one. Wait, what is? No, oh gosh, never mind. This is an ad. This is not the table of contents. Um, you can see this this issue is in significantly worse condition. Um, it has been exposed to a lot more moisture at some point than the others. You can see um, on the cover here, I don't know how, it, it's sort of fogged. It looks to me like at one point in time, uh, this cover was growing mold and it has been remediated. Um, and so I, I think there's like dead mold on the cover. Um, but you can see the water staining. Um, and it's, it's a pulp magazine, so the pages are brittle and fall apart anyway. Um, this, with the addition of the water damage, is in just really bad shape. Um, it's still, though, possible to turn the pages. It's just that each page you turn, uh, you have to make sure you keep it there because uh, it's not attached to the book anymore. Um, but we've got like Ice Planet by Carl Selwyn. Uh, Carl Selwyn is a name I recognize. I don't know why, but I do recognize it. Um, I have not read Ice Planet, that's for sure. Tremaine did write The Spacian. I'm not surprised. Uh, with it uncredited, I kind of figured that the editor was probably the one writing them. Um, I thought they were pretty good. And his, his editorial in the first issue also, I thought, was, was pretty good. Um, so we've got up through the rocket mail, uh, up to page 128, we do not have the very end of issue four because the back cover and I, I believe probably a couple of pages are missing from issue four. Um, but let's look at issue five real quick. 
technically it's time to uh, for the stream to end, but um, we'll look at issue five. Uh, and you can see these little bits of paper. I, I've not been doing anything really bad to the books. I've been handling them very gently. This is just, it was printed on really cheap paper and this is what happens over time. Um, that's why they're called pulp. Because of the cheap, cheap paper. <clears throat> All right, so we got Comet, issue five, the final issue from July 1941, The Vortex Blaster by E.E. E. Smith, Ph.D. Uh, the Street That Wasn't There by Clifford B. Simak and Carl Jacoby. We're starting to get names that are very recognizable. You can see the, the cover layout is different this time too. Instead of that column on the side, they still have the title, the very comic-y title, um, but now it's just the feature image with just a little bit of stuff. Devil's Asteroid by Manly Wade Wellman. Again, like all of the names on the cover of this one, E.E. E. Smith, uh, Clifford Simak, Carl Jacoby, and Manly Wade Wellman, those are all well-known names in the history of speculative fiction. Um, the Street That Wasn't There is such a good title for a sci-fi short story. Um, that is one of the ones that I had marked to potentially read, uh, so I think we will read it. Um, the two that I had marked were uh, The Street That Wasn't There and The Vortex Blaster. Um, the Vortex Blaster went on to become a novel, uh, but the very first short story of it was published here. Or I, I guess it's a feature story, but I don't know exactly how long it is. 27 pages, it looks like, but it goes on to become a full-length novel by E.E. E. Smith. <clears throat> but yeah, so this, this issue has E.E. E. Smith, Manly Wade Wellman, R.R. R. Win uh, Winterbottom, uh, Clifford Simak and Carl Jacoby, uh, Frank N Belknap Long, Lee Brackett, <clears throat> Robert Arthur, Effie Hardart, and Graf Wald Waldire. Some of those I don't know, but a lot of them are, are very well known. The short shorts, uh, The Bell Tone by Edmund Leftwich, and The Ultimate Experiment by Thornton Decay, or Decay, sorry. Uh, then of course, The Spacian, The Door to Tomorrow, an edit editorial, and Rocket Mail. I if we have time, we'll glance at the door to tomorrow because I'm curious if it is a goodbye to the magazine. Um, the cover was by Leo Mori again. Uh, but the street that wasn't there, page 18, which is definitely what the art from the cover is, is for, is, I think. Or maybe it's the Devil's Asteroid. I assumed it was the street that wasn't there because of where the title was, but... Also, it's entirely possible it has nothing to do with it because um, oftentimes artists just drew art and it had nothing to do with the stories that it was paired with in these magazines. Although this is late enough that it should. All right, trying not to hurt the spine. The street that wasn't there. Mr. Jonathan Chambers left his house on Maple Street at exactly seven o'clock in the evening and set out on the daily walk he had taken at the same time come rain or snow for 20 solid years. The walk never varied. He paced two blocks down Maple Street, stopped at the Red Star Confectionery to buy a Rose Trofero Perfecto uh, then walked to the end of the fourth block on Maple. There, he turned right on Lexington, followed Lexington to Oak, down Maple again, and to his home. He didn't walk fast. He took his time. 
he always returned to his front door at exactly 7.45. No one ever stopped to talk with him. Even the man at the Red Star confectionery where he bought his cigar remained silent while the purchase was being made. Mr. Chambers merely tapped on the glass top of the counter with a coin. The man reached in and brought forth the box, and Mr. Chambers took his cigar. That was all. For people long ago had gathered that Mr. Chambers desired to be left alone. The newer generation of townsfolk called it eccentricity. Certain uncouth persons had a different word for it. The oldsters remembered that this queer-looking individual with his black silk muffler, rosewood cane, and bowler hat once had been a professor at State University. A professor of metaphysics, they seemed to recall, or some such outlandish subject. At any rate, a furor of some sort was connected with his name, at the time an academic scandal. He had written a book, and he had taught the subject matter uh, of that volume to his classes. What that subject matter was long had been forgotten, but whatever it was had been considered sufficiently revolutionary to cost Mr. Chambers his post at the university. A silver moon shone over the chimney tops, and a chill, impish October wind was rustling the dead leaves when Mr. Chambers started out at seven o'clock. It was a good night, he told himself, smelling the clean, crisp air of autumn and the faint pungence of distant wood smoke. He walked unhurriedly, swinging his cane a bit less jauntily than twenty years ago. He tucked the muffler more securely under his rusty old top topcoat and pulled his bowler hat more firmly on his head. He noticed that the street light at the corner of Maple and Jefferson was out, and he grumbled a little to himself when he was forced to step off the walk to circle a boarded-off section of newly laid concrete work before the driveway of 816. It seemed that he had reached the corner of Lexington and Maple just a bit too quickly, but he told himself that this couldn't be, for he never did that er, for 20 years. Since the year following his expulsion from the university, he had lived by the clock. The same thing, at the same time, day after day. He had not deliberately set upon such a life of routine. A bachelor, living alone with sufficient money to supply his humble needs, the timed existence had grown on him gradually. So he turned on Lexington and back on Oak. The dog at the corner of Oak and Jefferson was waiting for him once again and came out snarling and growling, snapping at his heels. But Mr. Chambers pretended not to notice and the beast gave up the chase. A radio was blaring down the street and faint wisps of what it was, what it was blurting floated to Mr. Chambers. Still talking, please. Empire State Building disappeared. Thin air. Uh, thin air. Famed scientist, Dr. Edmund Harcourt. <clears throat> The wind whipped the muted words away, and Mr. Chambers grumbled to himself. Another one of those fantastic radio dramas, probably. He remembered one from many years before, something about Martians. And Harcourt, what did Harcourt have to do with it? He was one of the men who had ridiculed the book Mr. Chambers had written. But he pushed speculation away, sniffed the clean, crisp air again, looked at the familiar things that materialized out of the late autumn darkness as he walked along, where there was nothing, absolutely nothing in the world that he would let upset him. That was a tenet he had laid down 20 years ago. There was a crowd of men in front of the drugstore at the corner of Oak and Lincoln, and they were talking excitedly. Mr. Chambers caught some excited words. It's happening everywhere. What do you think it is? The scientists can't explain it. But as Mr. Chambers neared them, they fell into what seemed an abashed silence and watched him pass. He, on his part, gave them no sign of recognition. That was the way it had been for many years, ever since the people had become convinced that he did not wish to talk. One of the men half started forward as if to speak to him, but then stepped back and Mr. Chambers continued on his walk. But at his own front door, he stopped, and as he had done a thousand times before, drew forth the heavy gold watch from his pocket. He started violently. It was only 7.30. For long minutes, he stood there staring at the watch in accusation. The timepiece hadn't stopped, for it still ticked audibly. 
but 15 minutes too soon. For 20 years, day in, day out, he had started out at seven and returned at a quarter of eight. Now, it wasn't until then that he realized something else was wrong. He had no cigar. For the first time, he had neglected to purchase his evening smoke. Shaken, muttering to himself, Mr. Chambers let himself in his house and locked the door behind him. He hung his hat and coat on the rack in the hall and walked slowly into the living room, dropping into his favorite chair. He shook his head in bewilderment. Silence filled the room, a silence that was measured by the ticking of the old-fashioned pendulum clock on the mantelpiece. But silence was no strange thing to Mr. Chambers. Once he had loved music, the kind of music he could get by turning in symphonic orchestra, by tuning in symphonic orchestras on the radio. But the radio stood silent in the corner, the cord out of its socket. Mr. Chambers had pulled it out many years before, uh, to be precise, upon the night when the symphonic broadcast had been interrupted to give a news flash. He had stopped reading newspapers and magazines, too, had exiled himself to a few city blocks, and as the years flowed by, that self-exile had become a prison, an intangible, impossible wall bounded by four city blocks by three. Beyond them lay utter, unexplainable terror. Beyond them, he never went. But recluse though he was, he could not, on occasion, escape from hearing things. Things the newsboy shouted on the streets, things the men talked about on the drugstore corner when they didn't see him coming. And so he knew that this was the year 1960, and that there were wars in Europe and Asia, and, uh, and that the wars in Europe and Asia had flamed to an end to be followed by a terrible plague, a plague that even now was sweeping through country after country, like wildfire decimating populations. A plague undoubtedly induced by hunger and privation and the miseries of war, uh, but those things he put away as items far removed from his own small world. He disregarded them. He pretended he had never heard of them. Others might discuss and worry over them if they wished. To them, they simply did not, to him, they simply did not matter. But there were two things tonight that did matter. Two curious, incredible events. He had arrived home 15 minutes early. He had forgotten his cigar. Huddled in the chair, he frowned slowly. It was disquieting to have something like that happen. There must be something wrong. Had his long exile finally turned his mind? Perhaps just a very little, enough to make him queer? Had he lost his sense of proportion, of perspective? No, he hadn't. Take this room, for example. After 20 years, it had come to be as much a part of him as the clothes he wore. Every detail of the room was engraved in his mind with clarity. The old center leg table with its green covering and stained glass lamp. The mantelpiece with the dusty bric-a-brac. The pendulum clock that told the time of day as well as the day of the week and month. The elephant ashtray on the uh, tabaret. The elegant ashtray on the tabaret. And most important of all, the marine print. I do not know this word, tabaret. That one is new to me. Mr. Chambers loved that picture. It had depth. He always said, it showed an old sailing ship in the foreground on a placid sea. Far in the distance, almost on the horizon line, was the vague outline of a larger vessel. There were other pictures too, the forest scene above the fireplace, the old English prints in the corner where he sat, the courier and Ives above the radio. But the ship print was directly in his line of vision. He could see it without turning his head. He had put it there because he liked it best. Further reverie became an effort as Mr. Chambers felt himself succumb succumbing to weariness. He undressed and went to bed. For an hour he lay awake, assailed by vague fears he could neither define nor understand. When finally he dozed off, it was to lose himself in a series of horrific dreams. He dreamed first that he was a castaway on a tiny islet in mid-ocean, that the waters around the island teemed with huge poisonous snakes, uh, hydrophinae, and that steadily those serpents were devouring the island. 
In another dream, he was pursued by a horror which he could neither see nor hear, but only could imagine. And as he sought to flee, he stayed in the, in the one place. His legs worked frantically, pumping like pistons, but he could make no progress. It was as if he ran upon a treadway. Then again, the terror descended on him. A black, unimagined thing, and he tried to scream and couldn't. He opened his mouth and strained his vocal cords and filled his lungs to bursting with the urge to shriek, but not a sound came from his lips. All next day, he was uneasy, and as he left the house that evening, at precisely seven o'clock, he kept saying to himself, you must not forget tonight. You must remember to stop and get your cigar. The street light at the corner of Jefferson was still out, and in front of 816, the cemented driveway was still boarded off. Everything was the same as the night before, and now, he told himself, the Red Star Confectionery is in the next block. I must not forget tonight. To forget twice in a row would be just too much. He grasped the thought firmly in his mind, strode just a bit more rapidly down the street, but at the corner he stopped in concentration. Bewildered, he stared down the next block. There was no neon sign, no splash of friendly light upon the sidewalk to mark the little store tucked away in this residential net in this residential section. He stared at the street marker and read the word slowly, Grant. He read it again, unbelieving, for this shouldn't be Grant Street, but Marshall. He had walked two blocks, and the con confectionery was between Marshall and Grant. He hadn't come to Marshall yet, and here was Grant. Or had he, absent-mindedly, come one block farther than he thought? past the store, as on the night before. For the first time in 20 years, Mr. Chambers retraced his steps. He walked back to Jefferson, then turned around and went back to Grant again, and on to Lexington, then back to Grant again, where he stood astounded while a single, incredible fact grew slowly in his brain. There wasn't any confectionery. The block from Marshall to Grant had disappeared. Now he understood why he had missed the store on the night before, why he had arrived home 15 minutes early. On legs that were dead things, he stumbled back to his home. He slammed and locked the door behind him and made his way unsteadily to his chair in the corner. What was this? What did it mean? Oh wow, it's, it's a lot longer. Um, by what inconceivable necromancy could a paved street with houses, trees, and buildings be spirited away and the space it had occupied be closed up? Was something happening in the world which he and his secluded life knew nothing about? Mr. Chambers shivered, reached to turn up the collar of his coat, then stopped as he realized the room must be warm. The fire blazed merrily in the grate. The cold he felt came from something, somewhere else. The cold of fear and horror, the chill of a half-whispered thought. A deathly silence had fallen, a silence still measured by the pendulum clock, and yet a silence that held a different tenor than he had ever sensed before. Not a homey, comfortable silence, but a silence that hinted at emptiness and nothingness. There was something back of this, Mr. Chambers told himself, something that reached far back into the corner of his brain and demanded recognition, something that tied up with the fragments of talk he had heard on the drugstore corner, bits of news broadcasts he had heard as he walked along the street, the shrieking of the newsboy calling his papers, something to do with the happenings in the world from which he had excluded himself. He brought them back to mind now and lingered over the one central theme of the talk he overheard. The wars and plagues, hints of a Europe and Asia swept almost clean of human life, of the plague ravaging Africa, of its appearance of, in South America, of the frantic efforts of the United States to prevent its spread into that nation's boundaries. Millions of people were dead in Europe and Asia, Africa and South America, billions perhaps, and somehow those Gruesome statistics seemed tied up with his own experience. 
something, somewhere, some part of his earlier life seemed to hold an explanation. But try as he would, he be, his befuddled brain failed to find the answer. The pendulum clock struck slowly its every other chime, as usual, setting up a sympathetic vibration in the pewter vase that stood upon the mantel. Mr. Chambers got to his feet, strode to the door, opened it, and looked out. Moonlight tessellated the street in black and silver, etching the chimneys and trees against a silvered sky. But the house directly across the street was not the same. It was strangely lopsided, its dimensions out of proportion like a house that suddenly had gone mad. He stared at it in amazement, trying to determine what was wrong with it. He recalled how it had always stood foursquare, a solid piece of mid-Victorian architecture. Then, before his eyes, the house righted itself again. Slowly, it drew together, ironed out its queer angles, readjusted its dimensions, became once again the stodgy house he knew it to be. With a sigh of relief, Mr. Chambers turned back into the hall, but before he closed the door, he looked again. The house was lopsided! as bad, perhaps worse than before. Gulping in fright, Mr. Chambers slammed the door shut, locked it, and double bolted it. Then he went to his bedroom and took two sleeping powders. His dreams that night were the same as on the night before. Again, there was the islet in mid-ocean. Again, he was alone upon it. Again, the squirming hydrophinae were eating his foothold piece by piece. He awoke, body drenched with asper er, sorry, body drenched with perspiration. Vague light of early dawn filtered through the window. The clock on the bedside table showed 7.30. For a long time, he lay there motionless. Again, the fantastic happenings of the night before came back to, the, to haunt him. And as he lay there staring at the windows, he, rem he remembered them one by one, but his mind still fogged by sleep and astonishment, took the happenings in its stride, mulled over them, lost the keen edge of fantastic terror that lurked around them. The light through the window slowly grew brighter. Mr. Chambers slid out of bed, slowly crossed to the window, the cold of the floor biting into his bare feet, he forced himself to look out. There was nothing outside the window, no shadows, as if there might be a fog, but no fog, however thick, could hide the apple tree that grew close against the house. But the tree was there, shadowy, indistinct in the gray, with a few withered apples st still clinging to its boughs, a few shriveled leaves reluctant to leave the parent branch. The tree was there now, but it hadn't been when he first had looked. Mr. Chambers was sure of that. And... Now he saw the faint outlines of his neighbor's house. But those outlines were all wrong. They didn't jibe and fit together. They were out of plumb, as if some giant hand had grasped the house and wrenched it out of true. Like the house he had seen across the street the night before, the house that had painfully righted itself when he thought of how it should look. Perhaps if he thought of how his neighbor's house should look, it too might right itself but Mr. Chambers was very weary, too weary to think about the house. He turned from the window and dressed slowly. In the living room, he slumped into his chair, put his feet on the old cracked ottoman. For a long time, he sat trying to think. Then abruptly, something like an electric shock ran through him. Rigid, he sat there, limp inside at the thought. Minutes later, he arose and almost ran across the room to the old mahogany bookcase that stood against the wall. There were many volumes in the case, his beloved classics on the first shelf, his many scientific works on the lower shelves. The second shelf contained but one book. And it was around this book that Mr. Chambers' entire life was centered. Twenty years ago, he had written it and foolishly attempted to teach its philosophy to a class of undergraduates. The newspapers, he remembered, had made a great deal of it at the time. Tongues had been set to wagging, narrow-minded townsfolk failing to understand either his philosophy or his aim, but seeing in him another exponent of some 
anti-rational cult had forced his expulsion from the school. It was a simple book, really, dismissed by most authorities as merely the vagaries of an overzealous mind. Mr. Chambers took it down now, opened its cover, and began thumbing slowly through the pages. For a moment, the memory of happier days swept over him. Then his eyes focused on the paragraph, a paragraph written so long ago the very words seemed strange and unreal. Man himself, by the power of mass suggestion, holds the physical fate of this earth. Yes, even the universe. Billions of minds seeing trees as trees, houses as houses, streets as streets, and not as something else. Minds that see things as they are and have kept things as they were. Destroy those minds and the entire foundation of matter, robbed of its regenerative power, will crumble and slip away like a column of sand. His eyes followed down the page. Yet this would have nothing to do with matter itself, but only with matter's form. For while the mind of man, through long ages, may have molded an imaginary of that space in which he lives, mind would have little conceivable influence upon the existence of that matter. What exists in our, own, uh, in our known universe shall exist always and can never be destroyed, only altered or transformed. But in modern astrophysics and mathematics, we gain an insight into the possibility, yes, probability, that there are other dimensions, other brackets of time and space impinging on the one we occupy. If a pin is thrust into a shadow, would that shadow have any knowledge of the pin? It would not. For in this case, the shadow is two-dimensional, the pin three-dimensional, yet both occupy the same space. Granting then that the power of men's minds alone holds this universe, or at least this world, in its present form, may we not go further, farther, sorry, and envision other minds in some other plane watching us, waiting, waiting craftily for the time they can take over the domination of matter. Such a concept is not impossible. It is a natural conclusion if we accept the double hypothesis that mind does control the formation of all matter and that other worlds lie in juxtaposition with ours. Perhaps we shall come upon a day far distant when our plane, our world, will dissolve beneath our feet and before our eyes as some stronger intelligence reaches out from the dimensional shadows of the very space we live in and wrests from us the matter which we know to be our own. Um, wow. Uh, there are many more pages, and I'm going to have to leave it there. This isn't a good story. Um, I think it should be available online. Um, uh, yes. It is available from Project Gutenberg. So uh, let me drop a link in, so, so that you can finish the story if you want. Uh, doop -doop -doop -doop. Because, um, yeah, I have gone over by a half an hour and I do need to be uh, wrapping up for the day. Uh, thank you, Shadows, for looking up tabaret, tabaret or tabaret uh, seems to be a side table. Um, but yes, if you wish to continue uh, The Street That Wasn't There by Carl uh, Simak and, Car uh, by, sorry, Clifford Simak and Carl Jacoby, um, you can find the full text uh, via Project Gutenberg at that link. Um, I would love to read the whole thing. I just do not sadly have the time. Um, hopefully this was fun, uh, visiting Comet, the um, pulp science fiction magazine that issued five total issues uh, starting in December of 1940 and ending in July of 1941. Um, it had such 
good content, but apparently uh, its backers weren't willing to fund it long enough for it to build an audience, and um, that meant that it ended, sadly. Um, coming up next week, I have more uh, from the archives. Next week, um, next week I have a variety of collections featuring uh, the recent additions to our American Civil War collections. So I have a variety of things. Um, they've got some interesting highlights. I know there was like a, a an argument in favor of women's equal education that I found in them. Um, yeah, it, it, so uh, five or six collections that we recently added um, to our holdings, all related to the American Civil War, um, which is one of our main collecting areas. Uh, and then of course, on the 31st, it will be part five of our high energy physics series. Um, we will be looking at uh, what I have titled the Collins Cosmotron Correspondence. Um, Paul Collins, I think is his name. I can't remember. Uh, but he was one of the, the directors at Brookhaven that uh, he, he was in charge when the Cosmotron was built. So uh, we're going to look at his stuff. Uh, and then... I probably will be taking a break from the stream um, later in the summer I, uh, as I prepare my dossier for our equivalent of tenure. Uh, so I'm looking at probably mid-June through mid-July. I will not uh, be doing the archive stream so that I can free up some work time to um, catch up on a few things as well as um, hopefully document some of my process so that I can offload it and get some help to, to make this all happen. But um, I hope that you all had fun today. Uh, I hope it was interesting for you. Let me see who is live and, uh, and where we're going to raid. Because um, it's always great to pass on the love. Um, do, do, do live channels at the moment. I do see a Stephen Jones. I do see a Monterey Bay Aquarium. Uh, Black Girl Gamers. Penny Arcade. Yeah. Got the shark cam going on Monterey Bay Aquarium today. Any preferences? I don't know. We could do the aquarium. Uh, we could do Steven. If anybody has a suggestion, any any other educational streams would definitely be welcome. Um, but if no, I'm gonna go for sharks. I think today um, it's always great background to. Uh, have for the end of your day uh, the Monterey Bay Aquarium. We'll pop on over there. Um, yeah, thank you all so much for joining me today. I hope that I will see you soon. Um, until I do, keep exploring history, everyone. <laughs>